Good morning. All right, so we're going to finish up 3.2. There's only one more example I want to do there, um, and then we'll move into 3.3 today. Um, just again, keep in mind um, the next homework um, on 3.1 and 3.2 is due by midnight tonight. Uh, so just make sure that you've worked on that. Um, and then the 3.3 and 3.4 homework again right now is due Friday. Um, I'm probably going to push that into next week. Um, we'll kind of see how far we get today and tomorrow, though. Um, then I'll adjust that date as we need to. Okay, with the 3.1, 3.2 stuff, make sure you get that done by midnight tonight. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns before we get started today? All right, so example eight, 3.2. We want to graph this polynomial, right? So we're just going to try to sketch a basic graph of what this would look like using the information that we've talked about throughout this section. So what's one of the first things we might want to look for here if we're going to try to sketch this graph? Okay, good, because if we can find the degree of the polynomial, right, and we can find the leading coefficient, then we can talk about the end behavior, right? So that's fine if we want to start there. And then, Matthew, you're right, we're going to look for x-intercepts also, right? So those are kind of the two things we need here is the degree, the leading coefficient, right? That'll give us end behavior, and then we need to find the x-intercepts. How would we find the degree of this polynomial? Good, right? So if you think about it, we have this first term, which is x to the fourth power. This piece right here is going to give us an x to the third power. And then this one down here is going to give us an x squared. And so now if we were to multiply all of that together, x to the fourth times x cubed times x squared, we would add all of those exponents together. 4 plus 3 plus 2 tells us that our leading term now should just be x to the ninth power. Okay, and all of those coefficients are ones, right? So we know that one times one times one, still just gonna be a one. So that's gonna give us x to the ninth. Okay, so any questions about how I got that as the leading term, if I were to multiply all that out now? All right, now, once we know the leading term, let's think about what this tells us. What's the degree of this polynomial then? Nine, right? Because we look at that highest exponent, so we know that's going to be nine. Now, in this case, we care about whether that's even or odd. So do we have an even or an odd degree this time? It's odd. So what does that tell us about our end behavior then? Good. Both ends are going in opposite directions. Okay. Then we're going to look at the leading coefficient. So our leading coefficient this time is going to be what? One, right? There's an understood one in front of that x to the ninth. Is that positive or negative? It's going to be positive. So now let's think about what that tells us about our end behavior then. As x approaches negative infinity, what is the y value going to do in this case? It's going to go to negative infinity also. Good. And as x approaches positive infinity, what's the y value going to do? Positive infinity. Good. Okay, so opposite directions there, right? The left-hand side is going to negative infinity. The right-hand side is going to positive infinity. So now we know the end behavior of this graph. Now let's look at our x-intercepts. How are we going to find our x-intercepts this time? Good. 
Good, set each one of those factors equal to zero, right? So we're gonna take the first factor here, x to the fourth, we're gonna set it equal to zero. Then we've got x minus two cubed equals zero and x plus one squared equals zero. Now, how would we solve that first equation to get x by itself? You need to take the fourth root, right? But if I take the fourth root of both sides here, what is x going to be equal to? Zero, right? Because the fourth root of zero is just zero, right? So that's one of my x-intercepts. Now, the other thing we need to consider here is what we talked about at the end of last class. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. So remember we talked about multiplicity. That's the number of times that a zero happens because that's gonna tell us whether it bounces or passes through the x-axis at that point, okay? So if we look at this zero here, how many times would this zero happen? So not twice, what was the exponent on this? It was four, right? So it, since the exponent is four, that tells us that this zero occurs four times. So we would say in this case that it has a multiplicity of four. So the multiplicity is only based off of whatever that exponent is. Since that was x to the fourth power, that x value happens four times, okay? Now, is that multiplicity even or odd? It's even. So what does that tell us about our graph at that point then? It bounces, right? So we know in this case, when we graph that x-intercept, that it should bounce off of zero now. So that's why the multiplicity is so important, is it's gonna tell us once we get to that zero, are we gonna just go ahead and pass through the x-axis, or are we actually gonna bounce off the x-axis there, okay? Any questions about that part? Okay, let's look at the next one. So again, we have x minus two cubed equals zero. Well, again, to get rid of the cube, we would need to take the cube root, which is still just gonna give us zero. So we have x minus two equals zero. Okay, so what's the value of x this time? Positive two, good, we would add two, x equals two. That's right, so Callie, the uh, multiplicity comes directly from that exponent. So since this was x to the fourth power, that's what told us there was a multiplicity of four, okay? You're welcome. All right, so now let's look at this one. So we got x equals two for this next zero. What's the multiplicity of this one gonna be? Three, good, because that was the exponent on that factor. So since we have a multiplicity of three this time, what does that tell us about the graph? It's gonna actually cross at x equals three, or yeah, x equals two time, right? Okay, so this is an odd value, and so we know it's gonna pass through, okay? All right, and then our last factor here, we're gonna have to take the square root to get rid of the square. Again, that's still gonna give us x plus one equals zero. So that's gonna give us what as our value for x this time? Negative one, good. Now we look at our, um, our multiplicity. What's our multiplicity this time? Two. And so what does that tell us about that point? It bounces there also, right? Because that's an even multiplicity. Therefore, it's gonna bounce off the x-axis at that point. 
All right, so now we should have everything we need to kind of sketch a graph. And again, this is a rough sketch. We don't know exactly the highest and lowest points and all that stuff, but we can at least get all the x-intercepts on there, get our end behavior correct, and then we'll look at Desmos to see how close we were, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and graph my x-intercepts. So I know there's going to be one at zero, which is the origin. I know there's going to be one at positive two, which is over here. And there's going to be one at negative one right over here. Now, my end behavior, we said it should be going in opposite directions. To the left, it's going down. So we're going to start down here. And to the right, it's going up. So it's going to be up here now. All right. Now, when I get to negative one, remember, we're going to have to bounce there. So I'm going to come up here like this. I'm going to get to negative one. And I'm going to bounce off the x-axis. All right, now my next zero that I hit is zero, right? So it's going to curve back up to zero. And again, that had an even multiplicity, so it's going to have to bounce there also, right? So it's going to come back up to zero, and it's going to bounce. And then my last zero is the positive two. It's going to pass through that point. Now, one thing that we have to remember is because this was a multiplicity of three, it's bigger than one, Instead of just passing directly through, it is going to kind of level out. Because if you remember back here on this slide, right, if m is greater than 1 and m is odd, then it's going to look more like this, where it kind of flattens out at that point rather than just going straight through it. So just make sure in this case that when we come back up through this point, it's going to flatten out a little bit and then it's going to continue up. Okay. And again, it does not matter in this case if you're doing a rough sketch where that lowest point is in between zero and negative one, in between zero and two, right? We don't know how high or low those are. So I'm not going to ask you to actually sketch these because I know you have access to Desmos, right? So I, I'm expecting that for things like this, you're going to graph them. This is more about just recognizing when we're looking for the zeros of a polynomial that you understand how many times they occur because I'm going to be asking on the test for you to find all the zeros of some of these and I want to make sure that you know how to actually count them up, right? So it's more about recognizing there should be nine, but the first one counts four times, the second one counts three times, and the last one counts two times, and that adds up to nine total zeros, okay? Yeah, in general with graphing, right, you have the Desmos access, so I expect that you're going to graph it there to see what it looks like. So I'm not going to ask you to graph things by hand. Any questions on that one now? All right, and speaking of Desmos, I'm going to switch over real quick. We'll look at the graph of this one just to see how close we were. There you go. And so you can see in this case, right, our end behavior was correct. To the left, it went down. To the right, it went up. We bounced at negative one. We bounced at zero. Notice at zero, because that multiplicity is four, it flattens out even more than it did at negative one because I only had a multiplicity of two. Um, so just keep that in mind. The higher that even multiplicity, the more flat it's going to become at that point. Um, and then again, it kind of levels out when we get to two, and then it continues up towards positive infinity. And again, those lowest points, right, we don't know exactly what those are yet. We're going to talk about mins and maxes um, and how to find those using our graph. Um, but in this case, right, as long as you've got them, the general shape of the graph correct, that's the main thing. All right. All right, so that's the last example for section 3.2. Let's jump into 3.3 .3 now. All right, so 3.3, .3, dividing polynomials. So now we're actually going to look at if you have two polynomials and you want to divide them, what's the process for doing that? And there's going to be two methods, um, one that works for all different types of polynomials um, and one that works for specific types but is a much shorter process, okay? So whenever you have that 
specific type of polynomial that you're dealing with, um, then we can use that form. So if P of X and D of X are two polynomials and D of X can't be equal to zero because that's the thing we're going to be dividing by, then there exist unique polynomials Q of X and R of X where R of X is either zero or a degree less than degree of D of X, meaning basically you're either going to get zero as the R, which is the remainder, or you're going to get some other polynomial that has a smaller degree than whatever you're dividing. Okay. In that case, we can write our answer in one of these two forms. Let me see if I can get all of this on one line so it looks a little better. There we go. All right, so either we're going to have P of X over D of X is equal to the quotient Q of X plus the remainder over the divisor, R of X over D of X. Or we could have this form, P of X equals the divisor times the quotient plus the remainder. And the only reason for this is because sometimes in um, WebAssign, it's going to ask you for the two different forms. So just pay attention to that, right? We'll write both forms for the first couple of examples. In general, this is the form I'm going to be using um, and the form that I would expect on a test. Um, but I will show you the other form just because some of the questions in WebAssign ask for both. Okay. All right now, those polynomials P of X and D of X are called the dividend and the divisor. So P of X is your dividend. Um, that's the polynomial you're starting with. And then D of X is your divisor. That's the thing you're dividing by. Q of X is the quotient. Okay, so that's kind of your answer. And then R of X is whatever the remainder is after you've done your division. So this is very similar to just basic long division that you might have done back in elementary school with actual numbers. Now we're doing that same process, but with polynomials so that we can actually get a polynomial as your quotient and a polynomial as your remainder. All right, so let's go through the process here, because right, I think it makes more sense to actually see it, right? And then we'll label everything so you can see what Q of X, R of X, all that stuff is. All right, so we're dividing here 6X squared minus 26X plus 12 by X minus four. And we're going to put our result in both of those forms that we saw on the last slide. All right, so we are going to do long division here. So when we do long division, the thing that we're dividing by, our divisor, is going to go on the outside of our bar. So we're going to do x minus 4 on the outside. And then on the inside, we're going to put our polynomial that we're starting with. So 6x squared minus 26x plus 12. And now, if you're ever missing a term, and we'll do an example like this, then you have to put a zero in its place. In this case, though, you know what's on the outside, we just have an x to the first power and a constant. On the inside here, we have an x squared, an x, and then a constant. So we're not missing any terms in between, right? But if we had like an x to the fourth and a constant, you'd want to put zeros in place of the x cubed term, the x squared term, and the x term just to fill that out so that things line up. All right, now, our first step for long division, we're looking at the first term of our, quote, or our divisor, what's on the outside, and the first term of our dividend, which is the thing on the inside. And we're going to ask ourselves, how many times does that x go into 6x squared? Again, that's all I have to look at are the first terms. Well, to do that, we can just take 6x squared and divide by x. So what is 6x squared divided by x? 6x, good. So now what I'm going to do, that's going to be part of my quotient. So I'm going to put that up top. I like lining things up, so I'm going to put it above the x term. As long as you put it above the bar, that's all that matters. All right, now once we have that piece, now we have to take that 6x and we have to multiply it by everything on the outside. So we're going to take the 6x and we're going to distribute it to x and the minus 4. What's 6x times x? Six x squared. I'm going to line that up under my x squared term down here. Then we're going to take the 6x and distribute it to the negative 4. What's 6x times negative 4? Negative 
24x. That's going to go under this x term right here. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. Any questions up to that point about what I've done? Right. Now, our next step in our long division process is we're going to subtract. So I'm going to group all of this stuff together now, and I'm going to subtract what I've got there. What is 6x squared minus 6x squared? Zero. And that should always happen with the first term if you've done your division correctly. Okay. So you are multiplying the 6x on top by the two terms. That's correct, right? So multiply what we've got on top by everything on the outside there, okay? All right, so those first terms, the 6x squares, those should cancel. Now we have a negative 26x minus a negative 24x. What's that going to give us when we do that subtraction? Good, right? That becomes an addition. Be careful here, right? It was negative 26 plus 24, so it's actually going to be what? Two x, it's going to be negative 2x, right? So this is going to be a negative 2x. And now our next step is we're going to bring down this next term. So that positive 12, we just bring that down. Any questions about what I just got right there? All right, now we repeat the process. This time though, we're looking at our first term on the outside and the first term that we have down here and what's left over. So I'm gonna take that negative two X and I'm gonna divide it by the X on the outside. What's negative two X divided by X? Negative two, good. That becomes part of my quotient, so I'm going to have a minus 2 up top. Now we do the same thing we did with the 6x. We distribute it to everything on the outside. So if I do that, what's negative 2 times x? Negative 2x. That goes under here. And then the negative 2 times the negative 4 is going to give us what? Positive 8. So we have a plus 8. All right, now, once I've distributed the negative 2 to everything on the outside, what's my next step going to be? Subtract. Good. So I'm going to group all this together, and I'm going to subtract. What's negative 2x minus negative 2x? Zero. And again, as long as we did everything correctly, those should always cancel. Then we have 12 minus 8, which is going to give us what? 4. Okay. Now, there's no other terms to bring down, right? So we can stop there. Now we have to see, does x go into 4? Well, does that x term, this first term here, go into what's left down here now? No, right? So 4 is not divisible by x. So once we get to that point where we can't divide anymore, this is now the remainder. And then whatever we have up here is our quotient. So if you're just listing out the pieces this time, we would say that Q of X is equal to six X minus two and R of X is equal to four. Any questions about that? We're still we're going to write it in the two forms that we saw in the previous slide. But any questions about how I got the quotient and the remainder using my long division process there? OK. 
Okay, so our two forms here, we have P of X over D of X equals, and that's gonna be this first one here where we just take the Q of X plus the R of X over the D of X. So our quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. So that's gonna give us the quotient, which is just six X minus two plus the remainder four over the divisor, that's the thing we're dividing by, which is X minus four. And again, that's the form I'm generally gonna ask for, right? Is just, you know, having the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. Okay, so make sure you're familiar with that one. But again, sometimes in WebAssign, it's gonna ask for the other form. So that's P of X equals, and that's gonna be D of X, the divisor times the quotient plus the remainder so our divisor this time is X minus four. Our quotient is six X minus two, and our remainder is four. So those are the two different forms you could write your answer in. And again, in WebAssign, just pay attention to which one it's asking for, because um, it kind of switches it up sometimes. And then sometimes they're only gonna ask for the quotient, the remainder, they'll give you a box for each and you'll just type those in. Okay, so sometimes that's the easy, easy ones, right? Um, but if they ask for the other forms, those are the two other forms you could have here. Any questions on that one now? So that is our process for polynomial long division, and it's the same no matter what polynomials you're dividing. Now, obviously, you know, the bigger the polynomials, the more steps there's going to be along the way, yeah, but the overall process is going to stay the same no matter what. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this one now. So this time we've got a fourth degree polynomial divided by a quadratic polynomial. And again, we want to find that Q of X and R of X. <clears throat> All right, so again, remember the divisor is the thing that's going to go on the outside. So I'm going to have 2x squared minus x plus 2. And then on my inside, we're starting with 8x to the fourth. Now notice this time we don't have an x cubed term, right? So I need things to line up here. So I'm going to put plus 0x cubed. So that's what I was talking about before. If there's a missing term, put a zero in its place so that everything lines up. Then we're going to have plus 6x squared minus 3x and plus 1. Okay, so there's our setup. Now, what's the first thing we're going to do here to start this process? Good, look at your first terms, right? So this time we have an eight X to the fourth, we have a two X squared. So we wanna know how many times does two X squared go into eight X to the fourth? We're gonna divide those eight X to the fourth over two X squared. What's that gonna give us? Four X squared, good, eight divided by two is four x to the fourth over x squared. We subtract those exponents, so we get 4x squared. That's part of our quotient, so that's going to go up top. And again, I like lining things up, so I'm going to put mine right here. All right, now, once we have that, now we're going to do what? Multiply, good. So I'll read that to everything on the outside here. So we got 4x squared times 2x squared. That's going to give us 8 x to the fourth. 4x four squared times the negative x is going to be a negative 4x cubed. 4x four squared times 2 is going to be plus 8x squared. And again, that's why it's so important to put that 0x cubed in there so that we have a space for everything to line up now. Okay. 
Any questions about what I got on that line there? Okay, what's our next step? Subtract, good. So I group all this together now and we subtract. Again, as long as we did everything correctly, those first terms should cancel out. 8x to the fourth minus 8x to the fourth is zero. That works. What are we going to get for that next term now? Good. It's going to become a positive 4x cubed because we're subtracting a negative. That turns into addition. And then we have 6x squared minus 8x squared is going to give us what? Negative 2x squared. Now, remember, at that point, we can bring down the next term. So we have a minus 3x here. All right. Now, what are we going to do? First terms again. So first term on the outside is 2x squared. First term down here is 4x cubed. We divide those. We have 4x cubed over 2x squared. What's that going to give us? 2x. Good. That becomes part of my quotient. It's a positive, so plus 2x. Now we keep going. We're going to multiply, distribute that up to the outside. 2x times 2x squared should give us a 4x cubed. 2x times negative x is negative 2x squared. 2x times 2 is a positive 4x. Any questions about that line? Okay, now just like before, we subtract, so group all that together. First terms cancel out, okay, 4x cubed minus 4x cubed is zero. What about negative 2x squared minus negative 2x squared? Also zero, right, because again, that becomes addition, so those are going to cancel out, and then we have negative 3x minus 4x is going to give us negative 7x. Negative 7x here, we can bring down our next term, which is a plus 1. Right. Now we ask ourselves, 2x squared goes into negative 7x how many times? It doesn't, right? Okay, so we can't divide negative 7x by 2x squared because x squared has a higher degree than x. So in this case, we stop right there. What we have left down here is the remainder now, and what we have up top is our quotient. So now in terms of Q of X and R of X, we would say that Q of X is 4X squared plus 2X, and R of X is negative 7X plus 1. Okay, so it's possible that our remainder actually has more than one term, right? It doesn't have to be just a number. Um, it could be a polynomial itself. And that's all it really asks for here is to find Q of X and R of X. Um, you don't have to write it in the two different forms this time. Any questions on that one now? Okay, now synthetic division, okay, so this is a quick method of dividing polynomials, but it can only be used if the divisor is of the form x minus c, and technically, or x plus c, right, where c just happens to be a negative value, right, so if it's in one of those two forms, x to the first power, plus or minus some constant, then we can use synthetic division, okay, but if you have anything other than that as your divisor, then you can't. You have to use long division in those cases. Okay, so that's why we start with long division, right? Because it'll work for anything, and synthetic only works in these cases now. 
So we're going to go through the process of synthetic division now to divide this first polynomial by x minus 3. All right, now the first thing we're going to have to do when we're doing synthetic division is figure out what zero would come from the factor that we're dividing by. And what I mean by that is we're going to take x minus 3 and set it equal to zero. So what would x be equal to in this case? Positive 3, right? So positive three is actually the value that we're going to use for our synthetic division. It's always going to be the opposite of whatever the number is in your factor. Okay, so if this is x minus three, we're going to use a positive three. If it had been x plus three, we would use a negative three. All right, but that's why is because we're really setting that factor equal to zero and finding that x value. That's what we're using now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a positive three here. I'm just going to put a little box around it. Now. To the right of that, I'm going to list out all the coefficients of the polynomial that I'm starting with, right? So first coefficient for this 2x cubed is 2. I don't need the variable, okay? I only need the coefficients here. Then my next coefficient of x squared is a negative 7. I'm going to put a negative 7. I'm missing the x term here. So just like with long division, we have to put a 0 in its place. I'm going to put a zero in place of the x term. And then finally, I have my constant, which is a positive five. So again, we don't have to deal with the variables at all. We only list out the coefficients, starting with your highest degree part, right, which is the x cubed, and then going from there. And any missing terms, always put a zero. Okay, now, once we have the setup, First step for synthetic division is to bring down this first coefficient. So that two comes down here below the line. At that point, we're gonna take that value, we're gonna multiply it by what's in our box. So we're gonna take two times three, what's two times three? Six. Six is gonna go underneath the next coefficient here. Now we're always going to add, okay? So this is always going to be addition. What's negative 7 plus 6? Negative 1. Now I repeat, negative 1 times 3 gives us what? Negative 3, that goes under my next coefficient. Now we add, 0 plus negative 3 is what? Negative 3. Now we multiply again, negative 3 times 3 gives us what? Negative 9, and now we add 5 plus negative 9 is what? Negative 4. So that's our process for synthetic division. Okay, so again, find that 0 from your factor. It's always going to be the opposite of whatever the number is. So in this case, it becomes positive 3. List out all of your coefficients, including any zeros that you might need in there. Bring down that first term, multiply by what's in the box, line it up, add them together, and just keep repeating multiply, add, multiply, add until you've exhausted all of your possibilities, okay? Any questions just on that process? Okay, now let's talk about what this actually tells us. Well, we started with 2x cubed. That was the degree of that polynomial, x cubed. We're dividing by an x to the first power, which means that whatever we get as our quotient should have an exponent one less than whatever we started with, right? Because x cubed divided by x should give us an x squared. So now I can take these numbers down here. Those are going to become the coefficients of my new polynomial. So this 2 represents the x squared term. The minus 1 represents the x term. And the minus 3 is our constant. Which means that this negative 4 now is the remainder. So we know that q of x is equal to all of this. And then our r of x is just going to be equal to negative 4. 
and we're done. Okay, so that's the process of synthetic division, right? You just have to understand how to line everything up. And then once we're done, your value is always going to be one less than the exponent of whatever you started with. So we started with an X cubed this time. That means we're going to end up with an X squared. And that last number will always be your remainder. Um, sometimes that remainder will be zero, right? And we're going to actually do a lot where that's our goal is to get a zero there. Um, but if it's not, then that is your remainder. Any questions on how we got that? Um, so there will be specific questions where you have to do both, right? So you need to know both methods. Um, the reason for that is I'm going to give you one that you can't do synthetic division, right? Like the last one we did example two, um, and then I'll give you one where you can use synthetic division um, and ask you to do it that way. This is actually the method that we're going to use a lot, though, for the rest of the unit, because when we're looking for zeros of polynomials, it's this process that we can use to test to see if zeros work or not. Okay, so we're going to use a lot of synthetic division, uh, but there will be one question on the test where you have to use long. Okay. Any other questions there? All right, remainder theorem. So if P, is a P of X is a polynomial and we divide it by X minus C, the remainder is the value of P of C. Okay, so let's think about what that means. I'm gonna go back to the example we just did. What that tells us now is my C value this time was three, right? So now I know if P of X is that polynomial that I started with, 2x cubed minus 7x squared plus 5, then p of 3, p of the c value, should be equal to whatever the remainder is. So p of 3 should be equal to negative 4. Now we can test that pretty easily, right? Because I can plug in 3 here and see if it actually gives us negative 4. So that would be 2 times 3 to the third minus seven times three squared plus five. Three cubed is 27 times two is 54. Three squared is nine times negative seven is negative 63 plus five. So that's gonna give us 54 minus 63 is a negative nine plus five should be negative four now. Okay, and so this does check out. So really, this is useful when you're trying to substitute a value into a polynomial and you have really large exponents or even a really large value that you're substituting in. The synthetic division typically keeps those values a lot smaller and easier to work with. So if you don't have a calculator handy, you can actually use this process, get your remainder, and that'll actually give you the value of the function at that point. Okay. Any questions about what that what I just said there? Again, like here, you know, 54 and negative 63, right? Those values are much larger than what we had to use for the synthetic division, but we get the exact same answer using synthetic division that we would get by actually substituting that value in. Okay. Now, the real usefulness of this is that when we get a remainder of zero, that means that zero is the value of the function at that point. So we can say that if we get a remainder of zero, then that point must be a zero or an x-intercept of our graph. And so that's really what we're gonna be looking for moving forward is how can we get remainders of zero, right? What values do we have to use in that case? Okay, all right, so let's take a look at this one. And we're just using that remainder theorem here to try to figure this out. So we want to find the quotient remainder first, and then we're going to use our remainder theorem to find P of negative two. Okay, so we can use synthetic division this time because we just have X plus two. What value goes in our box this time? Negative two, good. Remember it's always the opposite of what we had there. So positive two becomes a negative two. Then we're gonna list out all of our coefficients. Well, we have an x to the fifth, x to the fourth, x cubed. There is no x squared, so we have to remember to put a zero in that place. 
and we have our x and our three. So this is going to be three, five, negative four, zero for the x squared term, seven, and three. And one of the most common mistakes on problems like this is forgetting to put that zero in there. So just really look at those exponents, make sure you've got them all. And if you're missing one, make sure there's a zero, okay? All right, what's our first step now that we've got everything set up here? Good, bring down that first coefficient, so bring down the three. Now we can multiply. What's three times negative two? Negative six, that goes under the five, sorry. Then we're gonna add, so five plus negative six would give us what? Negative one, and I'm just gonna keep going here. Negative one times negative two, that should be a positive two. Then we add negative four plus two, it's gonna give us a negative two. Negative two times negative two is a positive four. Zero plus four is four. Four times negative two is negative eight. Seven plus negative eight is negative one. And negative one times negative two is positive two. Three plus two is five. Any questions about what we did there? All right, so now we need the quotient and the remainder, right? So let's think about our quotient this time. What is the exponent gonna be on our quotient? What degree would it have? Good, right? So we started with x to the fifth, we divided out in x, which means we're down to x to the fourth now. So that first coefficient, three, is three x to the fourth. Then from there, everything just goes down by one. So then we have a minus one x to the third, minus two x squared, plus four x, and minus one. Which means that our remainder is gonna be what this time? The five, good. So whatever that last number is, that's our remainder. We have a remainder of five. Now, the second part of this says we're gonna use our remainder theorem to find P of negative two. Well, based off of the work that we just did there, what should P of negative two be equal to? It should be equal to the remainder, and the remainder was five, so p of negative two is equal to five. And again, you could check that by plugging in negative two into that original function, but again, you gotta do negative two to the fifth power, which is gonna be you know, negative 32. Then you gotta multiply that by three, that's gonna be negative 96, right? You can see already how big those numbers can get, whereas using synthetic division, the numbers stay relatively small, and we can actually get that value just by looking at the remainder. Any questions on that one? Okay, so that's where we're going to stop for today. Again, don't forget the 3.1 and 3.2 homework is due tonight by midnight. Um, again, we'll wait and see how far we get tomorrow um, on 3.4, um, and then I'll kind of push that homework back accordingly. Um, but continue to work on the 3.1, 3.2, and you can get started on 3.3 now um, that we've done the synthetic and long division. Okay, have a great day, and I will see you all tomorrow.